Hello. Thanks for tuning in. This is Dr. B. Let's get to it. Chapter 11. Thinking, Winking, and Blinking. More Dangers. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Author Unknown. An old sea captain was quizzing a young naval student on the hazards of the sea. The old salt asked, What steps would you take if a sudden storm came upon the starboard? The student replied, I'd pull out an anchor, sir. What would you do if another storm sprang up aft? asked the captain. I'd throw out another anchor, sir, said the sailor. But what if a third storm sprang up forward? the captain asked. I'd get out another anchor, captain, replied the sailor. The captain exclaimed, Just a minute, son. Where in the world are you getting all those anchors? The sailor quickly responded, from the same place you're getting all those storms. Real storms will form in the lives of our children. Some of them will be mild and brief. Other storms can be brutal and have lasting effects. Dangers lurk in the shadows, waiting to bend the minds of our children. How a person thinks determines how they behave. Together, they determine the quality of their life and relationships. Unfortunately, there are many influences that can twist a child's life. The Poisoned Apple the occult. What could be more appealing to a teenager than the offer of power, the ability to influence and manipulate others as well as control their own lives? These promises are particularly appealing to the rejected. These children feel that they don't fit in. Children that have parents who are too busy for them and don't seem to care, and the kids who have repeatedly been scorned or bullied by others become easy prey. Their lives feel out of control, don't feel loved or a part of anything. These children represent those who are most vulnerable to becoming involved in such things as witchcraft. Groups identifying themselves as gothics, vampires, witches, and pagans have sprung up in our neighborhoods and in our schools. By their way of searching for love, identity, and belonging, they come across as odd or strange. They seek others like themselves. Many dress in dark clothing. Some wear deathly pale makeup. All have a need to belong. These children maintain a belief that through magic and ritual, natural energy can be used to change circumstances and other people. They long for a sense of control. There is the belief that through mystic arts they can change their lives. This philosophy challenges traditional beliefs. Wicca believes that there is no such thing as sin and that there is no God-given means of cleansing sin. They don't believe in an ultimate divine judgment, nor do they see a future bodily resurrection. Their values are in stark contrast to traditional religious communities. However, these groups do not tend to identify themselves as Satanists, especially those involved with Wicca. The term Wicca refers to a local coven, and Wiccan, a practicer of witchcraft, as a religion. There is a belief in duality. A female omnipotent power contrasts with a male omnipotent power, a kind of male-female energy balance. They believe that this godness emanates through all that is, all of nature and creation. This philosophy is reminiscent of the old philosophy of pantheism where God is all and in all, as opposed to being a separate, unique, overseeing being. Magic, karma, and the belief in reincarnation are frequent terms associated with this religious approach. There is no sense of an ultimate right and wrong, but just what is. The philosophy leads to many moral, or rather immoral, possibilities. For a teenager to find information about gothics, wicca, or the supernatural, they usually talk to a friend. However, they don't have to talk to anyone. A child need only plug into the internet or go down to their local bookstore. Wicca has easily accessible internet sites. Many traditional retail chains have carried books on witchcraft and the supernatural. However, a child can be touched by the supernatural elsewhere. A teenager merely needs to go into a local movie theater or in any video outlet. Movies as well as television programs present the supernatural in palatable and acceptable fashion. And who can deny the influence of music by artists like Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie proclaiming the power of the supernatural through their music? Even popular games can represent the supernatural. Who can forget games such as Dungeons and Dragons and Ouija boards? Witchcraft and the occult are presented as an alternative lifestyle in our society and sources of unspoken power. Symbols, imagery, and rituals of witchcraft are everywhere to be seen in American society. However, we have been so conditioned that they have been gradually accepted. We don't even realize our level of acceptance. Witchcraft is depicted as easily done, alluring, and innocent. The occult is very enticing to the teenager who doesn't feel understood, connected, or feels badly about themselves. It can give them a sense of power and belonging. 
Involvement tends to provoke more hostility towards parents, as well as emotional distance. A problematic home life makes them more vulnerable. There are signs that a child is involved in the supernatural that a concerned parent can look for. These are dark dress and makeup, the excessive use of incense and candles, the presence of diagrams and symbols such as moons, pentagrams, and odd inexplicable figures, recurring drumming or chanting, and the presence of books or other writing related to the occult. Another area to keep an eye on is a child's friends and if they give off these same signals. An area of particular concern is their attitudes and views on sex. Sex is often seen as a ritual and absent of any moral obligation. Sex acts and even abortion can be seen as sacraments of the religion. Dr. Laura was called by a concerned mother about her 17-year-old daughter practicing witchcraft. The mother didn't understand how the supernatural could hold so much appeal for her daughter. Dr. Laura told her that, It's because in your faith God has power, but when she practices witchcraft, she has power. The love of power and mystique can be too tempting for a teenager especially one who is seeking control and a place to belong. Some lyrics sung by Sarah McLaughlin emphasize this dark philosophy of life, a philosophy that can become religion. Her view of the Bible and God are made clear through lyrics by XTC from their album Skylarking. Dear God, don't know if you noticed, but your name is on a lot of quotes in this book. Us crazy humans wrote it. You should take a look, and all the people that are made in your image still believing that junk is true. Well, I know it ain't, and so do you, dear God. I won't believe in heaven or hell, no saints, no sinners, no devil as well. No pearly gates, no thorny crown. You're always letting us humans down. If there's one thing I don't believe in, it's you, dear God. The practice of witchcraft presents a view of life, morality, and justice that is very contrary to established views. To combat the possibility of involvement in witchcraft and the occult, parents need to spend time with their children. Children need to feel loved, cared for, and accepted for who they are. Negativism and criticism need to be kept to a minimum. Encouragement and support need to be chosen. There should be an active attempt to understand the needs of teenagers, particularly their desire to fit in, to be loved, and get attention. If they don't receive these things at home, they will look somewhere else. They will find them elsewhere. This reality should cause parents to set and enforce boundaries concerning behavior and attitudes. Parents need to set a good example by the movies they watch and the books that they read. Children will watch and take more seriously what parents do than what they say. Allowing Ouija boards, tarot cards, astrology charts, and crystals into the home only encourages a teenager to explore the realm of the occult. Parents should keep their eyes open for the outward signs of involvement in the supernatural. Signs can include self-mutilation, radical hair and clothing choices, fascination with the supernatural, tattooing, and the presence of satanic music and symbols. When a child shows these signs, it's time to talk and find out the attraction and what they are trying to get out of the experience. One of the best things that a family can do is to enhance their own spiritual involvement by getting involved in a church that proclaims appropriate values and attitudes. Another concern for many parents may overlap with occult involvement. Body piercing can overlap or be completely separate. Body piercing When considering body piercing, are we dealing with beauty or mutilation? Is it a form of self-expression and art, or is it an expression of the need for attention, rebelliousness, or an attempt to compete with peers? Is piercing a result of falling under the pressure of friends, or an attempt to be identified with them? Or could it be, for some, the hope that looking odd and different will frighten others so that they won't bother them? Is it a means to combat fear and send the signal, don't mess with me? Body piercing is widespread and considered by the young to be body art. Its popularity has grown incredibly over the last few years. Body piercing is particularly appealing to those who want a form of self-expression or identification with a group. For some, it even provides a sense of beauty. Body piercing can be performed on the cheeks, lips, noses, eyebrows, ears, and erogenous zones. Almost any part of the body with a little loose skin can be pierced. One of the most common forms of body piercing is piercing the tongue. However, even uvulas have been pierced. That is that little flap of skin hanging over the throat in the back of the mouth. Curiosity and the desire to experiment are also factors that draw some to body piercing. So, are there any health risks? Is body piercing dangerous? The American Dental Association has come out with a formal statement regarding tongue piercing, citing the possibility of infections and transmission of diseases, as well as tooth damage. The National Institute of Health has pronounced that body piercing is a possible route for the transmission of hepatitis, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. 
Both the ADA and the NIH are concerned about the use of unsanitary piercing methods. Infections can result from non-sterile instruments and inefficient methods of sterilization, which do not kill bacteria and viruses. Health regulations generally require that the premises where piercing is performed be kept clean and hygienic. Any device used for penetrating skin must be sterile. Once an item has been used to penetrate skin, it must be disposed of immediately or thoroughly sterilized. Any article used on one person must be cleansed before using it on another. Those performing piercing must themselves be clean, which includes their clothing. They must have no exposed cuts, abrasions, or wounds. The air should be clean of smoke and contaminants. These are the basic conditions for piercing that are to be met. Piercing guns are one method and are of particular concern. These devices are very common to ear piercing. There has been no way found to effectively sterilize a piercing gun, and it is easy to pass blood contagions from one person to the next as the gun is repeatedly used. Alcohol swabs or bleach solution appear inadequate as cleansers. Sanitizers don't always reach all the crevices. Piercing guns are also very traumatic to the body, as they use a dull stud to rip through tissue. Holes are typically uneven, and this makes healing more difficult. A piercing needle is actually easier to clean and less painful and provides more even surface for healing. Due to the way piercing guns are made, they can move or not function fully as the trigger is being readied and pulled. This can be particularly problematic when piercing navels and nipples. Movement increases the chance of scarring or nerve damage. This means of piercing and sterilization are vitally important, but so is the type of jewelry that is inserted. Body jewelry should be made of high-quality metals, surgical-grade stainless steel, solid 14-carat or 18-carat gold, titanium or platinum is best. Sterling silver or gold-plated sterling silver or gold-filled jewelry should not be worn while a piercing is healing. Some people have problems or allergic reactions with these metals even after healing. Jewelry should be smooth with no sharp edges that can cut or irritate skin. Jewelry should be constructed in such a way that it can be easily and properly cleaned. A person considering piercing should be sure that the operator or technician performing the piercing is wearing sterile rubber gloves and is experienced in their job. The following concerns apply not only to skilled body piercing technicians, but the unskilled and unsanitary as well. These concerns also apply to the teenager, who often doesn't want to wait or sees a professional as being too expensive. So they attempt to pierce themselves with various pointed instruments. The first concern is the possibility of infection. Lack of sterile instruments and techniques can lead to transmission of viruses and bacteria, including hepatitis and HIV. Tetanus is also a risk. The mouth, in particular, is a breeding ground for bacteria, as it naturally contains an abundance. The next danger is scarring. Keloids are a common scarring danger, often seen with African and Asian Americans. Scarring can also take place if piercing is done in a fleshy area that is too thin and tearing occurs. When piercing is too deep, a layer of scar tissue can form. Scarring can be very uncomfortable and cosmetically unappealing. Dental damage is another possible problem. Tongue piercing is very prominent. The metal used for this jewelry is hard and can lead to cracked teeth. The jewelry can also become loose and then be swallowed. A loss of taste and nerve damage can also occur. Numbness can be experienced. Tongue piercing can impede speech and cause excessive drooling. These are not attractive qualities. Teenagers can also have reactions to the type of jewelry that is implanted. Jewelry intended for the ears may not be appropriate and can be rejected in other areas of body piercing. Inferior materials can break down in the jewelry and corrode. They can create horrible infections or holes in the tissue. The jewelry itself can rub or tear, depending on its construction. Diabetics and hemophiliacs should think twice before having body piercing done. Due to difficulty with wounds healing, diabetics could experience complications. Hemophiliacs, because of the possibility of excessive bleeding, could see piercing leading to a life-threatening situation. Reaction of jewelry is also a possibility. The body can react as if invaded by a foreign substance. Inappropriate jewelry, cleansers, or hygiene can lead to scar tissue buildup in the created cavity. Scar tissue can gradually push out the jewelry. Areas of the body such as eyebrows and navels are especially prone to rejection. If body piercing is going to be performed, be sure that a hospital autoclave to sterilize equipment is used. The technician needs to be using a fresh pair of disposable latex gloves. They need to use either a brand new piercing needle or a disposable piercing needle, which will be disposed of immediately after use. After piercing, a person should be sure to get aftercare instructions and ask if follow-up care will be provided if problems are experienced in the future. In general, be sure that the facility, technician, and tools are clean. 
While piercing is not recommended, if piercing is done, it is imperative to be hygienic and keep new piercings clean. Being careful will minimize the chance of scarring and infection. Cautions As previously mentioned, the American Dental Association, the National Institute of Health, and most independent doctors do not recommend body piercing. This is due to the risks involved. It is recommended that before entering a possibly permanent situation that alternatives be used. Non-piercing jewelry for the nose, ears, and eyebrows can be purchased at local malls and through the Internet. However, the first recommendation is no involvement at all. But sometimes parents seek compromise. Teenagers who are seeking work can also be advised that most employers are not going to look favorably on their body piercing. While an adolescent will see this attitude as discrimination, it is common practice. In a job interview, an employer is looking at the appearance and for good grooming because most jobs deal with the public. It can also be assumed by employers that body piercing represents a bad attitude, rebellion, or lack of cooperation with authority. In making the choice to pierce, a teenager may be choosing not to work. Kids should also be reminded that there is no way to predict whether or not a pierced opening that has been created will scar or close properly. A hole in an eyebrow or nostril may be more permanent than they want. They need to know what they are getting into before they get pierced. Unfortunately, a 15-year-old is not in a position to judge how a decision now can affect them over a lifetime. Looking cool at 15 isn't the same as looking cool at 25. And a 45-year-old wants and needs to look different than a 15-year-old. So, before considering body piercing, be sure that a child is completely informed and fully vaccinated. Point out the risks, such as the possibility of infection, pain, scarring, holes that won't close, and other problems. Don't allow a child to do the piercing themselves. There is a much greater risk of infection, scarring, nerve damage, or hitting a blood vessel. If they are going to be pierced, be sure that they find a clean, reputable shop that uses sterile instruments. Be sure the teen uses the proper jewelry. Ensure that they are educated and then comply with hygiene measures after the piercing. Some parents may want to be prepared to negotiate. For example, if five earrings were desired, perhaps one or two would be agreed upon. However, when it comes to the body, the less piercing, the better. Less is healthier. However, body piercing isn't the only form of art drawing young people. Tattoos Tattoos are another form of body art, self-expression, or as some prefer to see it, rebellion. Once again, the argument can be made for art or mutilation. Tattooing can be a form of identification with a group, or a means of attracting the attention of peers. What must be emphasized with tattoos is their permanency. A child is usually not giving consideration to the fact that a tattoo is something that is intended to remain for the rest of their lives. That is why it is particularly stupid to tattoo a girlfriend or boyfriend's name, or some group of which they are a member. Teens have had the example of seeing movie and music celebrities get such tattoos, later to their regret. This permanence is also a good reason for keeping a tattoo small, if one is to be gotten at all. Formally, the FDA has the power to regulate tattooing due to its power to regulate pigments and inks as well as cosmetics and color additives. However, they have not attempted to regulate tattoo inks and the pigments used in them. They have deferred to local law jurisdictions. Due to the permanency of tattoos, as well as the risks, which will be described in a moment, it is not recommended that anyone get a tattoo, especially not until they reach the age of maturity. The legal age to get a tattoo will vary from state to state. Getting a tattoo involves needles inserted into a bar, which is contained within a tube. That needle bar with the attached needles is then projected out of the tube and into a person's skin. The needles are repeatedly stabbed into the flesh. Tattooing takes time, anywhere from 30 minutes and up, depending on the size of the tattoo. It causes pain due to the needles being inserted into the skin. Bleeding is part of the process, and blood must be wiped away periodically to continue. The basics of tattooing involve making a hole, then inserting the dye into that hole. Excessive dye is wiped away. The dye then makes a permanent impression. Dyes remain in thousands of holes, and a picture evolves. The risks of tattooing first involve infection, both bacterial and viral. The risk is real. For example, the American Association of Blood Banks requires a person to wait one year after having a tattoo before donating blood. Infections that can be transmitted include herpes, hepatitis, and HIV. Unclean equipment can result in boils and liver disease. There may also be allergic reactions to dyes such as severe rashes, swelling, nausea, and a variety of physical complaints. Scarring is another possible problem. Keloids can occur. Scars can occur that go beyond normal boundaries. Tattooing is a form of trauma to the skin, and the natural reaction of the skin can be to scar. There are times when medical tests need to be performed on an area covered by a tattoo. 
It has been noted that magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, can be problematic when the scanned area involves a tattoo. Some people experience swelling and burning in the tattoo area when having an MRI. Image quality can also be affected. This has also been true for permanent makeup, such as eyeliners, which is just another form of tattooing. If you are curious, take a look at Michael Jackson. People who have a history of diabetes, anemia, hemophilia, or any blood disease should not get tattooed. It is best to get the consenting advice of a physician before having any such procedure. The basics of safe piercing apply to tattoos. A technician performing a tattoo should be clean and hygienic. They should be wearing disposable latex gloves. An autoclave should be used for sterilizing instruments, specifically tattooing needles, tubes, and needle bars. Proper care must be taken after receiving a tattoo. Washing properly, using antibiotic ointments, and changing soiled bandages are a must. It's helpful to recognize the normal healing process of a tattoo. Tattoos will scab at first. The scab will then fall off. The skin will dry and gradually shed. This will leave a sensitive, itchy surface, which should not be scratched or picked at. It will take approximately two weeks for the tattoo to heal, and it will remain sensitive to touch for a time. However, irritation doesn't usually end with physical discomfort. Perhaps the most common problem with tattooing is dissatisfaction. A person can become bored with or dislike their tattoo. However, it was put on to stay. The risks should be noted when considering a tattoo. The truths about attempts to remove tattoos also need to be clearly understood. Reality and Removal It should be pointed out to anyone considering a tattoo that it will involve needles, pain, bleeding, and gradual healing. There is also the risk of infection, scarring, and ultimately, dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction leaves few possible cures. Removal is not an easy or inexpensive process. Taking a tattoo off will cost many times the money and discomfort it took to put it on. The first form of removal is laser treatment. Powerful lasers are used to lighten skin coloring. Unfortunately, it is often impossible to know what dyes and pigments were used to accurately set such a powerful device. Therefore, the results vary. There can also be allergic reactions to the use of a laser itself when removing a tattoo. Eye protection should be employed for both the clinician and the patient when a laser is being used. This is due to the possibility of airborne viruses and germs. Eye protection should also be used on the chance of the laser straying. Eye protection can reflect back the laser, assuming that the color is matched. There is also the danger of irreversibly darkening certain tattoo areas, which can become very unattractive. Dermabrasion is another technique for tattoo removal that has been used. This method involves abrading layers of skin with a wire brush, or diaphrase, which is essentially a type of sanding disc. This process can leave scars. Salabrasion is also an abrasive technique in which a salt solution is used to remove pigment. It is often used in combination with dermabrasion, but is not currently a common practice. Another approach is scarification, involving removing the tattoo with an acid solution and leaving a scar in its place. Surgical removal is another technique. Camouflaging is another means of dealing with an unwanted tattoo. This technique involves injecting new pigments to form a new pattern, or attempting to blend the tattoo into skin tones. The end result is that these methods do not leave the skin looking natural. Alternatives to permanent tattoos are temporary tattoos, usually known as henna or mendi. Unfortunately, the FDA has sent out an alert regarding the use of henna in applications to the skin. This primarily involves colors marketed as black or blue henna. For instance, there is a possibility of coal tar being contained in the black henna, which can cause allergic reactions. Due to the problems with even the temporary tattoos, they are not recommended unless the ingredients are FDA approved and say so on the label. Unfortunately, ingredients on the labels are not always clear, assuming there is a label. Logically, a temporary tattoo is a better choice than something that would be permanent. Permanent tattoo removal is costly. It is both painful and expensive. Many parents see driving in the same way. Teen driving. We are a society of drivers. Cars have become modern necessities, replacing the old horse and carriage. However, automobiles go far beyond just providing transportation. They have become status symbols. Adults view them as emblems of success, power, and money. To a teenager, it is no different. There is a tremendous appeal in the freedom of the road, the status of driving and being seen in a nice automobile. Adolescents see driving as a rite of passage. Driving is not viewed as a privilege by teenagers, but as a right. Too many parents have mistakenly put their teenagers into high-powered symbols of adulthood. These automobiles too often are no more than coffins on wheels. 
Giving a teenager a high-powered car is no different than placing a loaded revolver in a two-year-old's bed. Disaster is just a matter of time. Couple this reality with the lack of boundaries and supervision, and the result is the leading cause of death for individuals between the ages of 16 and 20. That represents more than 5,000 deaths every year, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. This is more than a serious problem. The danger threatens everyone's family and the future of our children. Most people would agree that the greatest loss that a parent can suffer is the loss of their child. Parents are not intended to outlive their children. The loss and the pain are too great. Parents must not invite disaster. The loss of a promising future and the guilt that comes from inaction or bad action is not the legacy wanted by a parent. Accidents do, of course, happen no matter how cautious we are. But by taking adequate steps, fatal possibilities are greatly decreased. We should remember that an automobile is a lethal weapon and represents a tremendous amount of power. A car can unleash incredible destructive energy on life and property. Teenagers tend to be more confident than they should be when it comes to getting behind the wheel of an automobile. This is particularly true with young men. Too often they lack an adequate level of fear to respect the power of the car or others on the road. They take chances, go at high speeds, and attempt to maneuver in and out of traffic in an unsafe manner. Teenagers assume that all will be well. Too often they put themselves into positions where they are inexperienced. This can be night driving, city driving, driving under the influence, or being too tired. Limits need to be set and rules need to be clear. Otherwise, it is like putting a $100 bill in their hand and telling them to only spend $10. More money will be spent and more of an automobile's power will be exercised. The freedom and power of driving and going too far is simply too tempting. Preparation Since most parents see driving as a necessity, they should also see it as a threat to survival and take appropriate precautionary steps. The first thing to do, of course, is to talk with your teenager. The dangers and responsibilities should be spelled out clearly. Their limitations and boundaries should be pointed out. The consequences if these rules are violated must be clear. This is vitally important. A teenager has a tremendous motivation to drive and to be seen driving by friends. Setting the boundaries and enforcing them can create motivation to comply. The loss of car privileges is not something an adolescent wants to face. In spite of the fact that teens see driving as a right, it is a privilege. Privileges can be taken away. Parents simply pointing out concerns and danger is not enough. Concerns must be backed with significant consequences. The threat of losing driving privileges is what prompts motivation that can override the tendency for rebellion and independence that go along naturally with adolescence. Rules and consequences are a way of avoiding a child being in one of the high-profile fatal accidents we read so much about in the papers. One more teenager is lost. One more tombstone is found. Standards need to be put into place, and parents need to map out how they are going to monitor the driving habits and patterns of their children. The next step is driver training. Training. There needs to be some sit-down education time provided by a police officer, driving instructor, or someone otherwise qualified in the dangers for and needs of teen drivers. Often this education involves videos and movies relating appropriate driving techniques, as well as the catastrophes that can occur. It is also recommended that a child be involved in a driver training school, which involves actual hours on the road. This should be a minimum of 20 hours, but it is recommended that the amount be closer to 40 hours. 5 to 10 hours should involve driving instruction at night. Remember, there is no substitute for experience. Teenagers are not experienced at driving and facing normal road situations. Overlapping this education should be a high level of involvement by parents, giving instruction and allowing a child to practice. This gives opportunities for a child to get more experience, for a parent to dispense wisdom, and for a parent to supervise the progress of their child. Lack of involvement is tantamount to being criminal. The stakes are too high for neglect. A parent can begin by placing their child behind the wheel in a setting where there are very few consequences for errors. One option is a large vacated parking lot where pulling forwards, backwards, turning, and parking can be practiced safely. Part of being a good driver is being comfortable behind the wheel. This includes knowing one's automobile and how to maneuver it, as well as keeping dangers in mind. An adolescent should understand everything from where to put the key to how to change a flat tire. Practice produces increased ability and insight. It also creates fewer things to have to think about. The Chinese have a saying, to control an ox, put it in a very large field. This principle applies to the beginning of teaching a teenager how to drive. From parking lots, driving can progress to rural roads with little traffic, primarily straight ones. Then, they can graduate to roads that are more windy. 
After a reasonable comfort level has been reached for both the parent and the child, some highway driving can be done. It is recommended that this practice be done at non-rush hour times to avoid overwhelming a child. Adolescents will gradually get to the point where they can drive in some heavy traffic. It is also recommended that in the latter stages, some city driving be done so that they can get used to high traffic areas, as well as stop and go traffic. Practicing keeping track of vehicles entering from various angles is also necessary. Increased experience helps with more freedom in meeting its responsibility. Practice and rules are part of meeting that responsibility. Independence Driving is but one more step towards the independence that comes with adulthood. With it come not only the responsibilities, but also the dangers. There are physical risks as well as legal ones. This applies not only to the driver, but anyone with them, as well as others on the road. Because of the risks, a teenager must know what is and isn't acceptable when it comes to driving. Teenagers under the age of 18 should not be permitted on the road after midnight and shouldn't be allowed back on the roads until after 6 a.m. These morning hours represent a high percentage of accidents for teenagers. It is also a time of day when it is much easier to get into trouble. This is the time of sex, alcohol, and other drug use, rushing to get home, or driving recklessly to impress friends. It's simply not worth the risk. Secondly, a teenage driver should not be permitted to have any passengers who are non-family members for the first six months of driving. This rule gives more opportunities for parents to monitor how their children are doing. It also takes away the potential for an immature driver to be tempted to impress friends or be influenced by peers to drive recklessly. This rule also limits yours and their legal risks. Having friends in the car tremendously increases the chance of having an accident. After six months of driving, teen drivers should be limited to two non-relative passengers at a time until they turn 18. This minimizes the chance of partying in a moving car and the party crashing. These restrictions provide opportunities to practice safety in traffic and stay focused. A teenager is more likely to stay in control of that huge metal machine. Most automobiles will range in horsepower from 110 to 260 horses and weigh between 2 and 4,000 pounds. To put this in perspective, imagine your child sitting in a little buggy, holding the reins, connected to 150 horses lined up in front of them. Can they control such a mass of muscle? A teenager is going to shake those reins and hurtle down the road as fast as 110 miles per hour. They must make turns, stop when they need to, and be ready to react to any bad drivers that they come across. In their hands and at the tips of their toes is the power of life and death. They need time to practice and learn to respect the power at their disposal. Teen drivers should be as safe as we can help them to be, and safer than they think they need to be. Special Precautions some children have special needs or limitations that require modification of standards for driving. For example, a child who has poor eyesight would need their rules for driving to reflect this. No driving should occur without wearing corrective lenses. A child who is night blind would obviously need to have night driving restrictions. The child who suffers from attention deficit disorder or attention deficit with hyperactivity should be required to take their medicine regularly. The potential for attention drifting or becoming distracted is too likely to happen without their medication. Impulsivity and distraction can be killers on the road. The chance of getting into an accident is greater for them than the average kid. However, even the average child runs a risk of being distracted. Teenagers who are taking antidepressants should have to take their medication as a requirement to continue their driving privileges. An automobile in the hands of a child that is too emotional or could become agitated is a dangerous thing. Even if there is not a concern about emotion behind the wheel, driving privileges can motivate them to stay on their medication. Kids who have some physical limitations obviously need to have guidelines and an automobile that reflect their needs. Cell phones have become so prevalent that their use deserves some attention, as it relates to driving. Using a phone in the car needs attention because it takes away the attention of the teenage driver. An adolescent may have enough difficulty staying focused on the road without this electronic distraction. Talking on the phone should be a no-no for teenagers. They already have too many things to pay attention to and get used to while driving. More and more accidents are being attributed to the use of cell phones while driving. Cell phones are great for emergencies and touching base with parents, but they should not be used when the car is in motion. The rule should be to be stopped when using the phone. Expect some resistance to this rule by your teenager because it's not cool to have to pull over. Eventually, a hands-free unit may be used. Speaking of distractions, another touchy area with teen drivers is music. Music tends to be an area of conflict between parents and their kids anyway. Nonetheless, music in the car is not recommended for the first six weeks of driving. After that point, music should be kept at a modest level. Parents can specify the type of music and loudness. 
Finally, a no-tolerance policy towards alcohol or other drugs should be spelled out at the very beginning of driving privileges. Any evidence of alcohol or drug involvement should immediately result in losing the privilege to drive. Remember, driving is a privilege, not a right. It is a privilege to have transportation to school and other activities without having to ride the bus or be driven by someone else. Driving should be dealt with as a privilege that allows a teenager to practice and get ready for more independence. Later, when driving becomes a right, as an adult, they're prepared for it. Summary Being safe on the road is difficult when alone, but even more so when having passengers. Safety requires practice, practice, practice. There is no substitute for experience. Children should be given ample opportunities to practice, but be kept within reasonable situations to keep them as safe as possible. Friends can be fun, but also have the potential of being a bad influence. Friends as passengers should be limited in number and limited to those whose parents are comfortable being in the car. Remember, a high-powered automobile, especially in the hands of a teenage boy, can tempt to be reckless. The number of friends who are in the car amplifies this fact. Kids want to impress their friends. Too often they go beyond their ability or otherwise place themselves in critical situations. Impulsive and other dangerous acts are scary enough, but add drugs and alcohol, and we have a formula for tragedy. Use of any alcohol or drugs should immediately result in severe consequences, including loss of automobile use. Any reckless driving should result in the same. Remember, a mixture of alcohol and gasoline is combustible. Whenever possible, teenagers should contribute to insurance costs, or at least help pay for gas. Contributing helps to reinforce the responsibility of driving, as well as the expense that goes along with it. There may even be a little more appreciation of what parents are providing. Bearing some of the expense also puts teens on the way to recognizing what it will take to keep a car on the road when they are out on their own. Most adolescents don't have a clue as to what it costs to maintain an automobile, so let them learn. Car expenses should not represent an open account to a teenager and the bill footed by the parents. There is an exception, however, when a parent should be generous. Since an adolescent's job is to do well in school, the more they apply themselves to their studies, the less money they should be required to spend on car maintenance. Finally, while our discussion has focused on our teenagers driving, a note needs to be made about other adolescents. The unfortunate truth is that our adolescents could be just as dead in someone else's car as in their own. Therefore, rules should be spelled out for riding with other people, especially teenagers. Fatal accidents too often involve several teenagers in the same car. The sound of mouths and music create a tremendous amount of distraction and opportunities for showing off. It's another risk not worth taking. Know who your kids are getting in the car with and let them know who they are not to be riding with. Set consequences which enforce these guidelines. Children are irreplaceable. Don't take the chance of losing them to a gas-powered machine. The Tragedy of 9-11 and Dealing with Stress On September 11, 2001, Terrorists struck out at freedom, democracy, and all peace-loving people. They not only hurt men and women, but also children. Such a diabolical deed and its effects did not end there. A stark reality hit home. The world is different than we thought. The truth slapped us in the face. This was no less true for our children. When these heartless maniacs struck, they not only attacked adults, but they made war on our children. They prompted confusion, fear, insecurity, and worry. Their actions shook the very foundation of the world's stability and our children's futures. However, there are steps that we as parents can take to help them when they experience any form of anxiety. Recognize. A child's reaction to trauma and loss involves grieving. There are many thoughts and feelings that pass through them. Their expressions of hurt and confusion are affected by their personality, age, maturity, and how close they were to the traumatic event. The factors affect how deeply a child is affected. Children are inexperienced in dealing with disasters. They are experienced in how to work through their emotions and how to express themselves. Children are impressionable and like sponges, soak in all that is going on around them. Common reactions to stress for a child include sleep problems, bad dreams, clinging to loved ones, acting as if they are younger than they are, stomach aches or headaches, being irritable or angry, misbehavior, appearing frightened or easily startled, poor concentration, decreased immunity, feeling vulnerable, obsessing about what happened and worrying that something else might occur. The list of possible effects is a long one and can affect the emotional, psychological, and physical. Taking action. Much of a child's reaction to trauma and stress is a reflection of their parents' reaction. How we respond and deal with tragedy will transfer to our children. They will take their cues from us. 
If we overreact or are too emotional, a child will understand our behavior to mean there is something greatly to be feared. Our fears will feed the flames of their anxiety. Hysteria can also send the message that parents are overwhelmed or may even be powerless, which then can shake a child's sense of security and well-being. The first step parents need to take in dealing with tragedy is to remain calm and model a sense of control. This is not always an easy task. However, the control a parent shows puts them in a position to listen to their child's expression of hurt and confusion. An anxious child should be encouraged to express how they are feeling and to voice their fears. Giving permission to expose emotion provides parents with insight into how to support and comfort a child. As part of this self-expression, children should be encouraged to write and or draw about their feelings and thoughts. This provides more outlets for their confusion and emotions. It can also be a springboard into talking over feelings that they may otherwise hesitate to share. Providing examples of steps that have been put into place to protect a child is also helpful. Plans for the future that will help keep them safe should be shared as well. During trying periods of life, parents should be willing to spend a little extra time to support, encourage, and reassure their children. A child should be assured that they are safe and that trustworthy people are in charge and are taking steps to deal with the problems. Never attempt to talk a child out of their feelings or dismiss feelings as unimportant. This approach only encourages suppression of emotions or denial. A child quickly learns not to share their feelings. They are left with having to deal with emotion and problems on their own. Children aren't equipped for such a burden. Swallowing feelings leads to bigger problems later. Unexpressed feelings lead to stress and more fears, which build up over time into other problems. Please keep in mind that children will also engage in magical thinking. Kids can make connections between themselves and events that don't really exist. They tend to have a perception of the world revolving around themselves. For this reason, they can relate even the most distant tragedy to themselves, thinking that somehow they are related to it. They may believe that the same could happen to them, or even that they are at fault. This thinking can prompt feelings of guilt or further anxiety. Pay particular attention to a child's play after a stressful event, because this will often show what is going on inside of them. Behavior on the outside reveals thoughts and feelings on the inside. A child needs to have their misperceptions corrected. Furthermore, with any expression a child might make, whether it be verbal or through writing or drawing, they should not feel criticized, controlled, or directed in how to feel. This sensitivity should be maintained even if the child feels they have to say the same things over and over again or ask the same questions repeatedly. Be truthful when answering questions about what happened, but remember to keep explanations at an age-appropriate level. Explain to a younger child with fewer details. Older children can handle more information. When you're unsure of how much information to share, share less. Most children will let you know if they need more. Remember to use words that they can understand. The alternative to sharing is dangerous. When parents are not truthful, a child will learn not to trust, and then they won't share. It should also be kept in mind that when a child doesn't get good information from parents, they usually get bad information elsewhere. In the face of tragedy, routines and normal expectations for behavior should be maintained. By doing this, parents provide a sense of predictability and stability for kids. This security is part of what helps a child feel safe and secure. However, don't be surprised if they test some limits to make sure that things are still safe. This means that parents are still enforcing rules by giving consequences. Don't be overly critical if you see a child regress and revert to some earlier behaviors. Acting younger than they are for a short time is not unusual when stressed. Thumb-sucking, for example, is not unusual when a younger child is very distressed, even if they had set aside thumb-sucking for several years. Some children may be clingy or appear more dependent. Children may demand more time with their parents. Adolescents can react with moodiness and irritability. They will often deny that the events had any impact on them. Comments like, it doesn't matter, or it doesn't bother me, are commonplace. This denial is an attempt at self-protection and wanting to appear strong. All children, regardless of age, seek a way to express their feelings and protect themselves. Another temptation that parents need to be aware of is becoming overly protective. This excessive protection sends a message that there is more to be feared by a child. Overprotection doesn't make a child feel safer, but actually shakes their sense of safety. The approach also prevents learning to deal with life's injuries. By all means, take reasonable precautions to protect, but be aware that your child will glean messages from all that you do. A good reference source for how to help children cope with tragedy like 9-11 can be found at www.nasponline.org. The information was compiled by the National Association of School Psychologists and is an excellent reference for adults. It provides specific recommendations for parents and teachers dealing with trauma.
Concluding Thoughts The unfortunate truth is that such tragedies as 9-11 may happen again, especially given the state of the world and the hatred in it. Life has its normal share of loss and trauma as well. Parents want to protect their children from harm and any form of hurt, but even the most loving parent doesn't have the power to provide complete protection. So we must do what we can with what we have. Be supportive, reassuring, and available to children when tragedy strikes. Remember, we must control our own reactions if we are to help them with theirs. Their anxieties will feed off of ours. Play with them, read books, tell stories, and encourage them to draw pictures. This allows them to express their feelings and lets us in on what's going on in their minds. While healing, keep the TV off. More information will only overload and prompt more fear. Ask kids what they're afraid of or what they think about. Children tend to think that the same events will happen again. They often fear that they could be separated from loved ones or left alone. Kids also worry that they will be killed or injured or that something will happen to a loved one. Remember to reassure and reassure again. Finally, get back into your normal routine as best and as quickly as possible. Doing what they are used to doing inspires a sense of comfort and stability in children. Even after the worst injury, life must move on. But children need a little extra help. Conclusion Children of today face many threats. Threats can appear as beliefs in the occult. They can present themselves through body piercing and tattoos. Even normal development and daily activities can be very dangerous. Driving is at the top of this list. However, children also face the prospect of the unpredictable. Stress from attacks like 9-11, the death of a loved one, or the loss of a beloved pet can occur at any moment. Parents must be on guard to prevent problems when they can and provide damage control when they can't. The goal is to do whatever is possible to protect our children. Parents must be prepared to step in and take action to correct for the unpredictable. Threats to kids are not going to stop, so neither should a parent's vigilance.